you for coming. Thank you for being here. I'm assuming that um, it's safe to say that you love travel as much as I do. Um, maybe even really love travel, as in it's your passion, it is mine. You hopefully know 1,000 places. I've become known as something of the queen of lists. The 1,000 places had a, a spin-off, which was 1,000 places in North America alone. Um, and I've been doing revisions and updates um, along the way so that I've gotten quite used to doing these big tomes. And this is the original book, which actually next year is 20 years, which is a pinch me revelation when we actually um, realized when the light bulb went off that, yeah, 2003, which seems like centuries ago, um, 2003 to 2023 is 20 years. Um, so I was in the middle actually of doing the revision of the update for the next book. The first book took eight years to write. Um, we were talking with my friends about this idea of writing books and how easy many people think it is, and oh, I'll just throw together a book in a few weeks, and um, not a book of this kind, and not when you're the research um, master that I am, because I just love to research and read and do homework and go down that rabbit hole and come up the other end weeks later. Um, but also, it's a big world, and uh, the first book, my publisher said, uh, take a year, and take two if you needed it, and in fact, I took eight. <laughs> Every um, revision and update alone takes uh, three to four years, and that's what I was just beginning, and I was in um, Southeast Asia, which is um, actually one of the areas of the world that I love the most. And I was in Laos because I had never been. I had been to all the neighboring countries of Thailand and Myanmar and Vietnam, etc. But I had never been to Laos and it's so beautiful. We were really getting into it because it is just stunning and the people are beyond lovely and wonderful. And um, we started hearing word about this coronavirus thing. Um, and suddenly we were getting emails and they were sounding quite urgent and we needed to get out of there, we needed to get out of there. So it was a, a really kind of overnight 24, our last 24 hours were very confusing and very um, um, exasperating. We couldn't get information, the flights were being canceled, everything was shutting down, Heathrow was shutting down, America was shutting, all the borders were closing. So um, that kind of put the kibosh, as they say, on my um, update for this book, and I barely made it home. Um, just as an aside, um, Laos to this day has had zero deaths from the coronavirus pandemic, mm. um, and they share a border with China. So um, every country has been impacted very differently, but is it true that the entire world in some manner or form has been impacted? Oh yes. These are very different times, and if you travel, it's a different way of traveling. It's just the way it is these days. This uh, summer, I don't know if you were lucky, air quotes, to travel this past summer. Um, you've probably heard all of the horror stories about the delays and the cancellation and the lost luggage that would show up three weeks at your home after you returned, if it showed up at all, or it would wind up in you know, Pensacola or Juno or Buenos Aires, when in fact you were just going on a three hour trip to Buenos, to Chicago, I don't know, anywhere. But anyway, this summer's been really, really chaotic. Um, I've been doing a lot in the last 10 days or so, and it seems that things have calmed down. Um, it seems that this fall, everybody's hoping that things are a lot more organized. I think it was just a kind of perfect storm where all of the airlines had cut back. They had skeleton crews. The airports also just didn't have the people. They expected people to travel, but not in those numbers. Um, so it was pretty bad, um, to be honest. But ideally, if you've waited this long, um, you should wait just a little bit longer and start traveling again in the fall and into the holidays. And 2023 is supposed to be a banner year. So from my lips to the travel god's ears, um, hopefully things will really be almost pre-pandemic. That's not necessarily a good thing, but in this case, hopefully it is because the airlines are hiring again and all of those billions of dollars of loans and money that they got, I don't know where they went, but hopefully they'll be used to create an environment where you're, it's reliable that when you book a flight and you show it's going to leave and it's going to leave on time. So, pandemic. Suddenly I was not traveling at all. No one was. And it was a strange moment because I kept thinking, 
well, this pandemic thing is, you know, really impacting New York City, which is where I live. And we were hit particularly bad. I mean, horrifically bad. It was just um, a very surreal moment and continued for many weeks and months and actually a year and then two years. And we all kept thinking, well, it would pass and it would improve and it would clear up. And we kept, you know, baking Irish soda bed and cleaning out <laughs> our closets and uh, painting the deck and staying home. And people were working from home and the Zoom thing, you know, what was that about? I remember thinking, yeah, Zoom, I don't think so. I'm not doing that. Thank you very much. It'll pass. But, you know, here we are. I'm surprised, in fact, I'm not doing this appearance by Zoom because the virtual book tour seems to be the way of today. And it also conveniently saves an awful lot of money for the publishers who are sending their <laughs> authors on the road virtually or in the three-dimensional. You've got the latter, so yay. <laughs> But um, I was about to continue working on the book because I thought, oh, suddenly I have all of this time. But my publisher said, why don't we do a book that doesn't address where? Because everybody was always asking me, where are you off to next? Where have you just come back from? You know, where's in the book? Where are your favorite places? Where, where, where? But nobody ever, amazingly, when I thought about it, had ever asked me, but why do you travel? Or why does anybody travel? Or why? do people support this travel industry that is in the hundreds of billions of dollars? Why do people leave home? And they don't have to leave home to go to the other side of the world or to go on an African safari. They don't need to leave, you know, to do someplace remote and, you know, expensive that takes a year and a half to prepare and plan or that takes all of your energy and, you know, efforts just to make happen. It can be, where are we? Pasadena, it can be to the Four Corners area, it can be to Joshua Tree, it can be to look at all of our national parks. Really, as California residents, you are within a gas tank away from so much natural beauty. And I don't need to tell you that, but I am anyway. Because sometimes you need an interloper, an outsider who comes with an appreciative eye and says, do you realize? Because I hear it as a New Yorker all the time. You always see that people come from the other side of the world, the other side of the planet, to see what we have here within reach, really and underneath our, literally in our backyard. So, um, and that's what many people were exploring and visiting and seeing during the pandemic when we finally felt we were at a point where we could actually leave our homes and do something that was seemingly safe and it didn't entail getting on a crowded train, bus, plane, etc. So my, my um, publisher and I were tossing around this idea of why, and she um, was, you know, sitting, having coffee with me, kind of actually waiting for me to give her the why answer. And I said, I need to get back to you on that, because as simplistic as it is, it's really not so much. Um, it's a very profound answer, and it's a very personal answer, and if I were to randomly ask five people, and I won't, so don't get nervous, there's no audience participation, but if I were to ask five of you, why do you travel? There's a pretty good chance, I think, that there would be some kind of commonality. But there's also a very good chance that, you know, what gets you out the front door is not, you know, doesn't jive at all with, you know, what rings true to me. So, um, anyway, this is the book. Um, I thought that I could kind of, you know, throw it together in just a few weeks. Uh, then I realized it would take easily a year. Um, it took some time, but I had time for the first place since I could remember. I was actually not traveling for the first time since I could remember, and I had a calm moment. I had a moment to be um, reflective. I had a moment to kind of step back and create a perspective about the importance of travel and what it does for us. So it was a really opportune time and a very auspicious time. And what I wanted to do was to create, please just, it's fine. It's no, it's fine. Keep talking. Okay. Okay. Don't mind us. <laughs> well, you missed the audience participation part. <laughs> that didn't happen. So that didn't happen. We're making up for it now. <laughs> and you in the black shirt. So um, what we did want to do was to um, come up with a um, hundred reasons, but to really come up with one principle, comprehensive, 
stock answer that would resonate and appeal and make a lot of sense to a lot of people. And to me, that was merely the first words in the introduction of the book, and that is that travel feeds my soul. So there are so many things in life. Um, it can be gardening, it can be your grandchildren, it could be cooking or crocheting, it could be poetry or writing, it could be you know, one of countless things. And I think all of us of those short lists of things that feed our souls can include travel on that list. So why does it feed our souls? That's where the hundred reasons come in. And there are so many things that you kind of realize all along. It's what gets you excited when you decide to go someplace. It's what has you save all of your shekels and your dollars to make it happen. It's what has you put those two precious weeks every year, because that's how America works, mm. to make that trip happen. But whatever it is, these reasons are very shared by most of us. Travel is an education. Travel inspires us. Travel opens us up, travel makes us better people. Travel allows us to connect with other people. Travel is that jolt that kind of gets you out of the sleepwalking, putting one foot in front of the other mode of just getting from Monday to Tuesday to Thursday to Friday. Yay! <laughs> and then I just read on social media this morning, there should be a day called Sunday when you're enjoying the loveliness of Sunday, except that the light bulb goes off that Monday morning is here way too soon. But um, whatever it is, whatever reasons that we have for travel, I hope they're um, kind of personified in all of the different photography, quotes, captions, anecdotes, um, stories, listicles, everything that fills this book. Um, because the, photog the photos, I think, um, this was quite a departure for me because the other books with the exception of this coffee table book that's all about photography as well. Um, the 1,000 Places books really are pretty much all about text. And as a writer, that should come easy to me, but I'm not a fast writer. So in fact, it was always something of a challenge to capture the special essence of a place, be it a big city or a national park or a festival. Um, in this book, because the, ca the photographs, if you know all the books, the photographs are like postage stamp size photos. So it really is all about the description and it's all about the first couple of sentences because you know that we don't read anymore. We read headlines, we read social media, we read captions, but we don't actually read. <laughs> So actually, this book also was a challenge, but it was a great challenge because it really had me think about why is this place you know, knocking my socks off? What sets this apart from every other place similar to it but quite different from it? Why am I telling people to get on a plane and go and see it? What makes it stand out? So that was an exercise times a thousand places um, for me. And this book, um, why We Travel was quite the opposite. It was trying to find all of the best photos. And I thought, well, this is going to be fun. But in fact, it turned out to be quite impossible because you, when you deal with travel, um, well, I should say with photo banks or photo agencies, they have access to trillions of gorgeous photographs. And how you narrow that down to just a couple hundred thousand <laughs> It's really not easy. So when I would come up finally with this short list of quotations, because again, I had hundreds of quotations, but to find those quotations that really best summarized and that best expressed what I just couldn't say, from Aristotle to Willie Nelson, from Dolly Parton to D.H. Um, to Lawrence, I mean, the mix is as varied as um, are my thoughts about travel, and then to pair them with the proper photograph was not easy, but it was awfully fun. So did it take just a few weeks to put together? Oh no. We also wanted to create a variety, so it wasn't just overly philosophical, like, um, you know, not all classrooms have four walls, but also just fun, upbeat, notions that travel, in addition to being everything I mentioned before, is just plain fun. Travel kind of invigorates you, and travel, you know, re-energizes you, and a lot of people want to do that 
gorgeous island with the palm tree and the you know the the waters that are so stunningly every palette blue that you can imagine that has to be you know valley high incarnate and that to you is what feeds your soul and other people need to be immersed in total culture a city like paris or london or um, new york city or San Francisco, or any, you know, where it's just world-class museum after world-class museum. And then eating in world-recognized restaurants, having every imaginable cuisine available to you. So for a lot of people, it's culture, and a lot of people, it's natural beauty, a lot of people, it's man-made beauty. But I think um, what is the bottom line is that whatever it is in life, that brings you great joy. I'm sure you've heard that expression from Marie Kondo, to spark your joy. It already is very yesterday, but it is timeless because it just says, it expresses everything that it says, and that is that whatever that thing is that sparks your joy, then I encourage you to do it. I also think that people over um, imagine the effort and the risk, the perceived risk, or even potential danger of leaving home. And I would like to remind you that almost everything that happens that stops us from traveling happens in our bathrooms, in our homes. All of the accidents, the slips, the falls, the broken everything happens in the, the familiarity of your own bathroom, so that's reassuring. <laughs> and as uh, Tony Wheeler, who's the uh, founder and the original publisher of Lonely Planet, has always say, said, the most difficult thing is just getting out the front door. Because when you're at home, that's when you do, ideally, all of the planning and the organizing and the research and the phone calls. I mean, who gets on the phone anymore? The text, the emails, um, however you communicate, however you organize, however you research. Some people take a few days to put their trips together. Some will agonize over a trip for years, especially if it's a complicated trip or if it's a big ticket trip, like the you know, African safari or the trip to Mongolia or to the South Pacific Islands or someplace that entails connecting flights and a lot of money. And if you're traveling with somebody to kind of triangulate who can leave when and how much you want to spend and where you want to go, that's always couple dramatic hours when you talk to yourself and wonder if maybe you shouldn't be going alone. <laughs> and the trip also talks about solo travel, speaking of which, because so many people miss out on so very, very much because they can't find a traveling companion or mate. Whether it's your spouse, your significant other, your offspring, your sibling, your college roommate, all of the above, Sometimes it should be none of the above. Sometimes it really needs to just be you. Um, if I waited around at any point in my life for people to be interested, have the money available, the time available, and um, just the, you know, the, the energy to kind of make it happen, because everybody talks and talks and talks, don't they? But put your money where your mouth is and find out who's gonna actually put a down payment on that airfare and everybody disappears. So that happened to me one too many times. In fact, it was the very, very first time when I was doing my junior year abroad and five of us were going um, for Easter vacation to the Greek islands. I was studying in Spain, so it was quite close. And the Greek Orthodox Easter is really something very special. And um, there were five or six of us going, and guess who went alone at the end because I showed? Well, actually, it was reduced to two of us. And at the airport in Madrid, my traveling companion um, broke up with her boyfriend. And I watched. It was very, it was very theatrical in the airport, no less. Oh, but she, no. in that moment, decided that she would just forego the lost ticket and <laughs> sent me off on my way. And I thought that I would never see her again, or home, or America, or you know, I would just kind of disappear into the ether. And it was my first trip solo, and we were um, signed up for eight days, and I stayed for four weeks. So somebody had a very good time. <laughs> and do I speak Greek? No. It was
was all Greek to me. But it's amazing what and I did um, travel early on solo, and I think it's important to do that when you're young. And as the saying goes, the best time to do anything is when you're young, and the next best time to do anything is today. So maybe you didn't do it when you were, you know, like 19 years old at the Madrid airport and being forced off into the adventure of a lifetime that you see now in retrospect was the adventure of a lifetime. Or maybe your next trip, you know, next week, next month, next year. Consider going solo because it's an amazing, very, very, very different, unique, and invaluable experience. For, I mean, I have a hundred reasons alone for why solo travel is so important. I think if for nothing else, for no other reason, the life skills that it gives you to be more resourceful, to be more patient, to be more um, aware, to be more tolerant and um, sympathetic, and the response of other people to you is, you know, is it pity? I don't know, that's not a bad thing. But people <laughs> help you, it's not a bad thing. Um, and people help you more readily and more willingly, and there are lovely people everywhere, you know that. But it also helps you hone your radar and your sense of judgment, your judgment character. Because a lot of things happened to me that perhaps as the years went by, it would not happen to me later on had I been more careful or more discerning and all of that. But nothing was dangerous, nothing was, you know, unforwarded or unpleasant. It's just that maybe it could have gone a little bit better. But you know what they say, when a good trip is a good trip, it's a great trip. And when everything imaginable goes wrong, it's experience. <laughs> so um, I'm going to give you a few anecdotes, which I already have, but I'll give you a few more short stories because in choosing a lot of these um, aphorisms or affirmations, I realized that when I was thinking about just how special these aphorisms are, um, all of these stories would come flooding back to me. And one was on this idea that serendipity is the best travel guide because um, I'm German. Actually, I'm like 500% Italian, but my father is German, but he too became 500% Italian within the first few years of being married to my mother who was born in Southern Italy. So, um, so I had a real, um, a real dichotomy of wanting to travel and organize everything within a minute of the day. And then I just want to wing it and go with it because you know my gut feeling is that that's when all the good stuff happens. So I wind up having it be a little bit of each. So if you do find that, because especially if you're traveling alone, you want to know where your hotels are and you know you want to know certain structure and what you have to see and what's too good to miss because. I mean, how often do you go to Namibia? I don't know, how often, how often do you go to Chicago? How, how often do you go anywhere? Um, if you're like me, I very rarely go back to a second place because my list is thousands of places long. So until we can figure out how to keep me alive for 400 years, I tend, <laughs> I tend to not go back to the same place. And when I do travel with my husband, who ironically turned out to be Greek, um, so apparently I kept, nobody I met when I was 19, but who I met decades later, but apparently I discovered that in addition to loving Italy and Germany, I also loved Greece and all things Greek because here he is. So Nico is my husband, um, who's as 500% Greek as I am Italian, but there's an expression, two faces, one race, because the Italians and the Greek, I don't know if you ever heard about how we're all cousins, we all share the same DNA. Um, you can kind of swim from my mother's province near the heel of the boot to the island in Greece where his family is from. So that's cool. But anyway, um, so serendipity is really very, very special. If you do have this program where if you could color code every hour of the day, it would just be opaque, solid, pre-planned, organized stuff that you need to do that is prepaid and that is happening whether you want it to or not. But really, you need to let entire gaping holes and afternoons, if not just hours, left to put you out there and wander and see what happens because it's usually the highlight of your trip. And um, also, in the same breath as serendipity being the best tour guide, is the notion that those monkey wrenches um, almost always, well, not almost, those monkey wrenches I've seen always manifest 
in a silver lining, and those silver linings can be golden. And what happened with um, a trip to Casablanca, I love saying that name, Casablanca, um, and it's not where they filmed Casablanca, which was a Hollywood lot. That's the, the, the Moroccan city of Casablanca, which is really quite beautiful. And the Moroccan people are so super wonderful because they've been welcoming caravans and merchants for thousands of years. But um, I was with my friend, which means a lot too, because in this particular case, I probably wouldn't have been so readily eager to do what my friend and I ultimately did. But um, I'm getting ahead of the story. But we showed up at some dark hour of the late morning, like at five or six, to uh, catch a flight from Casablanca to Fez, which is another fantastic city, very biblical, very time warped in Morocco. And um, not only was our flight not leaving, but there was no flight. There never had been. They don't know how we were issued a ticket with a confirmation because for the last 11 years that flight had not existed. So you really do have to go with the flow. That's another yet another thing that um, I've become quite good at. Because in my gut, I always know that something is never going to be as drastic and horrible as it feels in that moment. In that moment, it's not pretty. <laughs> but usually, it has a way of improving. And so we didn't know what to do. We wandered out of the um, airport. And we kind of fell into the very um, kind help of a gentleman called Mohammed because 90% of the country, the men are called Mohammed. But what I remember about Mohammed, he was an older man, and he spoke a, a pretty good, well, it seemed like he spoke a good deal of English, actually, once we got past the initial bartering, and you know, he was a taxi driver. We, we got past his taxi cab driver vocabulary. In fact, it, it wasn't all that good, his English. But it didn't matter, because he was just so sweet and accommodating. But what I remember about him was this impeccable white jelaba that they wear the gowns, and these yellow leather slippers that turned up at the end, these pointed yellow leather slippers that turned up. So we were calling him Aladdin because, <laughs> because he was a lot cuter than Mohammed. But um, so he said, my Mercedes, my Mercedes, I'll take you to Fez. And we you know, did a very, we thought, wise um, negotiation of the price as he was walking us over to this very fancy, schmancy white Mercedes. And we stopped and we said, but first, we are starving. We have been up for eight hours, and it's not even noon time. We are starving, and we need the best couscous in Casablanca. Wherever the cab drivers go, if it's a dive, as long as we don't die, it, we, we just need to know that you know it's the best available. So he took his, from the pocket in his gelaba, he took out his iPhone, very animated conversation, screaming and yelling. Of course, we understood nothing. It was in Arabic. And um, he goes, come with me. So he takes a hard right, and he takes us to his car, <laughs> which was a Mercedes, I guess. It was like a 62 model, and it was held together by you know, spit and glue and duct tape. And that it even got us to Fez later that day was really a blessing. So, and we've gotten the back seat, and he's careening around town for almost an hour, to the point where my friend and I thought, well, maybe we didn't make the best decision. And um, he's taking us into the outskirts of town. And ultimately, we pulled up at this very modest building that had no door that turned out to be his home. And his mother and his wife and his two twin daughters and everybody in the building and pretty much the entire neighborhood was standing outside waiting for us with this big smile from ear to ear. And they just thought we were the coolest thing that had ever befallen them these two crazy, single, traveling, white, you know, Western American gals. And um, it was the Islamic day, of, it was Friday, which is their holy day, which is a day of prayer and family. And hospitality in Morocco is very, very, very important. And it's, um, it's in their DNA. I mean, they will greet you as family, whether they know you or not. And that's very, very much the way we were, we were treated. And we sat around the table and dug into this big pyramid of couscous that mom had been preparing for hours, as she does every Friday. 
So we um, were quite lucky. And it was funny, the young girls only spoke French because France used to be a French colony. And I know 11 words of French. Um, and all they wanted to know about was, I think, Britney Spears and Beyonce at the end of the day. So I said, oh, c'est magnifique, Beyonce, oui. Um, so that was really cool. And those kinds of things don't happen if you have this carapace where you will not connect with the people, where you, you know, just woe is me, the flight is canceled, I'm really annoyed, I'm really angry, and who do I write a letter to? And I'm convinced it's going to ruin your whole trip. And, um, and if you don't believe it, at the end of the day, they're very kind and they're very welcoming people who really, the, 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 your best, your benefit is what they have in mind. And they want to share with you and they want to make you enjoy their company. Because for the most part, if you are curious and you are respectful, and if you exude that, then they're pretty honored that you've come all this way to visit what they don't really think much about. It's home and they think, you know, they'd much rather live in America when we'd rather spend all of our time and money instead of visiting their home because Morocco is a fantastic, fantastic country. So these are the kinds of stories that are throughout the book. Another one is, and I won't, um, I won't put you to sleep, but um, I, can say that my earliest memory ever was um, when I was four. Uh, it wasn't Santa, it wasn't my first bike, it wasn't, I don't know, Christmas, Thanksgiving, but we were off to Atlantic City. We were off to the Jersey Shore. It was our annual August vacation. It wasn't extravagant, it wasn't expensive, it wasn't um, elitist or it didn't, you know, entail passports and planes and anything that, um, I mean, as a four-year-old, I thought it was all pretty special because I just thought I was the luckiest kid on the block. I was spending time with my family. Otherwise, I didn't see my father, who was always working two and three shifts um, at the local prison, so that was interesting. But on the first Thursday of every August, we were off to the Jersey Shore, woohoo! And I was in the back seat, I think, a week ahead of time because it was that special to me. And if I packed my own suitcase, probably not. I'm sure it was packed that far in advance as well. But um, that was my earliest memory. And so I kind of somehow must have known, even at that time, that um, travel needed to be part of my life. And I remember this annual vacation at the shore. And it was all sun and sea and sand and surf and the sun and dive bombing seagulls. And I remember the smell still. And I remember just how special it was. And so I knew that when the end of that vacation, those precious seven days, we stayed in a boarding house. I remember the German immigrant lady, Mrs. Atzer. She was like the police. Um, but that was a very memorable stay. And I couldn't wait for next August to come around soon enough. So fast forward, um, I did a trip or two. I befriended a girl from the Dominican Republic. I lived in a small town in upstate New York, and she was going to Santo Domingo for the summertime. And would I like to accompany her and stay with her family? And God bless my parents. My father, instead of working two shifts a day, would work three shifts a day. He made that ticket happen. So I was 15. It was my first passport. It was my first time of solo on a plane. I, in fact, got on the wrong plane that was going to Paris. So it was because those, those were the days when you would walk out the door of the gate and there would be six aircraft. And I just followed everybody else who was going to Paris. So I was seated in like 6F, I don't even know, on the plane that was going to Paris. And had I not heard them say, we will be leaving shortly for Paris, um, I would probably still be there. So, um, but Paris would have been nice, but not at 15 alone, because I had just been studying Spanish. And that's why Santo Domingo turned out to be so remarkable, because that was the first time I actually stayed with the family and immersed myself in another culture and different traditions. And it was 24-7 music, it was extended family, it was you know fresh mangoes and avocados from the backyard, and chickens running around, and. Um, nobody spoke English, and um, neither did I after the first 24 hours. And it was really a very, very, very special time. Um, it really kicked open the door for me. And when I went to university after that, I studied linguistics and Spanish and French and anything else that would let me um, study. But I did understand that you needed to, to travel 
a lot, as much as possible, as far as possible, whenever you could, at any opportunity. You couldn't just kind of sit around and wait for it to happen because I already sensed the urgency of life. There were no guarantees. We learned that with the pandemic. There are no guarantees, certainly, anymore. But one of the most important aphorisms or, or um, notions in this book that I hold so dear is that you really do need to do the difficult or the demanding things first, because I don't see a lot of teenagers in this room. <laughs> um, I don't know how old we are, but chances are you're north of 20. And um, it's just a given that um, we only have so much time, and don't you really want to spend it doing what you love? So one of the stories is about, in fact, doing um, the difficult places first, and that, uh, and that to me was Machu Picchu, which I did for my 50th, because I had already been hearing for many years about the altitude problems, and you need to first get to Cusco before you can even hope to continue on to Machu Picchu itself, and Cusco is at 11,000 feet above sea level. And I was quite cocky, because I thought, well, I've been to Denver. Do I need altitude sickness pills? Well, that's not funny. <laughs> and I thought, you know, how bad can it be? Because I'm prone to migraines, which should have been something that I thought through. Um, and, you know, so they go away. They, it, uh, how bad can it be? Well, it was bad. And I was in Cusco, Cusco and I was sitting in the hotel lobby with an oxygen mask on my face because the hotel manager was nice enough to try to save one of his hotel guests. <laughs> and um, I remember this woman kind of sauntering over to me across the lobby, um, looking very spry and sprightly, and like she didn't have a, an oxygen deficient bone in her body. And um, I remember thinking, oh, please don't want to have, I was the only one in the lobby, and I thought, please don't want to have a conversation with me because it's not going to work. So um, she sat down next to me, and I heard the whole monologue because I kept my mask on, and she was just fine. She was 90 years old. She had dropped out of school when she was 11. She put five children through school and graduate school, and probably because I mean, one was a gynecologist, one was a lawyer, and I remember thinking, and they waited until you were 90 to send you on this trip because they'd all gotten together for her mother's 90th and her 70th wedding anniversary. And the husband was upstairs resting because he wasn't dealing well with the oxygen either, with the altitude. And um, she said to me, well, actually, I don't usually mention this, but I should because it's so sweet. She said that for um, her 90th, she had always wanted to travel. And it had never, even as she grew older in her 60s, 80s, you know, approaching 90, it always remained very much forefront in what she wanted to do on her bucket list or her short list. And so for her 90th, they got together and they bought her a book called 1,000 Places to See Before You Die. Yeah, I usually forget to, to um, mention that. And um, that's when I took my mask off and I said, okay, really good taste. <laughs> and they gave her a yellow highlighter and she was, they told her she could highlight any place in the book that, um, that she would like to go to for her husband, well, for the wedding anniversary slash 90th birthday. I imagine the husband was 90, maybe 95, I don't know. But um, I, I guess the kids thought she was going to be highlighting, you know, like Boca and Dollywood and Vegas. But no, she said there was one place she always dreamt about going since she had seen it on the front cover of a National Geographic magazine. Um, and it was Machu Picchu. So I guess they, I could still imagine the rolling of eyes and they said, okay, and they sent them off to um, Machu Picchu. And she was just fine, but she did leave these pearls with me. And she said, you know, dear, you have to do the difficult places first. <laughs> and I thought, why is she like doing Mount Everest after this? <laughs> you know, I do want to be her when I'm 90 or 80 or 70. Um, but uh, she said, your knees have expiration dates. And she actually was on her second set of replacement, bilateral replacement knees. So this woman was unstoppable. She was the energizer bunny. And she is somebody that I will never forget. Her name was Edith, and she was really a lovely, lovely woman. So anyway, so the book is filled with stories like that that illustrate and really capture the um, importance, the value of travel, why it really fills us up and it fills our days. And it opens, I, there's a commercial now on TV that's something that's probably selling 
you know, like batteries or, or <laughs> gutters or, you know, like, I don't know, depends. Um, but it's, the word they use is open. And it's always the word that comes to my mind about how travel just opens you, but it opens your horizons and it opens your perspectives and it opens your head and your heart and your mind and your, I mean, it just opens you. And I kind of think I can tell, but I'm not sure because I'm a good judge of character, but I'm certainly not infallible. When you talk to somebody, you can tell who has never traveled. But more so than that, somebody who doesn't care to travel. Because there's a real difference. A lot of people like Edith wanted her entire life to travel and simply could not because she had five children. She had circumstances and responsibilities. And she was a washerwoman, she told me. So, you know, it's, she had reason to put travel aside in her eyes temporarily. But so there's a big difference between people who don't understand why they should travel or why it's important or, you know, why they should take up their best friend when they're going off someplace and they need someone to accompany them. It's like, no, 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 I'd rather stay home. I'm tired. You know, I've, I've been working a lot. And that's true, but if anything will energize you and kind of fill you with this invigoration and get you back needing a vacation from your vacation, but feeling like you've just had the most remarkable experience and met the best people and had the best food and just came back with life lessons for days, then it's travel. And I think that, you know, all of the reasons we have for not traveling are just that. The reasons, they're alibis. Um, you know, yes, it's expensive, so is Starbucks. You know, no one ever had <laughs> time, but you go and bring the grandkids to Orlando every Thanksgiving for the last six years. Oh, you know, yeah. know this, know that. So I, I just hope people um, see and, you know, step back as I did during the pandemic to realize and appreciate all over again why it's so important and why um, there are no guarantees. People live with this bet that, you know, I'll start doing, I'll start traveling when I retire, or when the mortgage is paid, or when the kids said, you know, like, I'll, I'll start soon. And guess what? So the pandemic had us understand that we only have so much control over life, so carpe diem, make it happen. There's no time like today. So um, I actually never even asked Nadia how long I'm supposed to be speaking, but I'm thinking I probably have. But you have, you have, you have flight, so you have, uh, oh, we've got hours. But if anybody, has, <laughs> if anybody has questions, and not just about the new book, but about a thousand places or anything um, you want to know about, I'm, I'm all yours. So, um, any questions? Yes. The book, A Thousand Places, uh, what year was that? Uh, um, what year was what year was the uh, was 1,000 Places initially published? That was 2003. So since then, have you been, have you had any revisions? Yeah. yeah. Every, um, so in the, tw in the 20 years, about every four or five years, a new edition comes out. And not because um, it shouldn't be done more frequently, but that's how long it takes me. And I have a team of people, but sometimes I wonder if I'm probably better off just doing it myself. But regardless, it's just so big, and we go through galleys and reprints and rewrites, and just to do a, a revision of a thousand page book that entails hundreds of countries and thousands of cities, you know, it's, it's, it's quite time consuming. But um, it was supposed to come out actually in 2001, and we've almost forgotten maybe the year, but we'll never forget September 11th. Mm -hmm but that happened 2001. So it was by chance that I wasn't even close to having it finished, and it turned out to be actually a good thing because if you remember, nobody uh, really moved from right. their home. Sure. And being from New York, it was very similar when we were hit with the pandemic because we kept referring to September 11th and how it all unified us, and it made us very um, close to be in this you know, similar circumstance uh, for, a certain, for reasons that were just really beyond, that were so surreal, you know, walking through the empty streets of Times Square, and there wasn't a soul, and even the lights were out, and the city was very still and somber, and it was a very sad place to be, and it reminded me a lot of, it reminded all of us of September 11th, and then of course it wasn't just New York City, it was all of America, and it wasn't just all of America, but it was all of the world. So um, yeah, it's, it's, sometimes it takes a jolt like that and something horrific like that to make us realize what's important to us in life. But um, 
hopefully we'll restart our engines and get up and out there and start doing everything that was put on the side burner during the pandemic um, or pre-pandemic. You know, you put off things and you wake up and you're 90. <laughs> Yes. So you've obviously traveled many, many places. What's your favorite thing about coming home? Um, so what's my favorite thing about coming home after you've traveled? Um, I want to read because I must have had an enlightened moment. <laughs> um, I often travel with a friend of mine who lives here in LA, and she pretty much cries the whole way home because she's so sad to come home, and also because <laughs> And also because we've um, always had the best time. And you know, there are times that just can't happen um, when, um, when you know, you're home Netflixing in your sweatpants. So um, I do know where to find it. I'm not going to look for it for you. Um, OK. Here we go, boys and girls. Um, wherever you go, however you travel, Allow it to enrich you, to connect you to others, to challenge your preconceptions, to open your head and your heart. And if you do, you'll understand why we travel and why we should never stop. It is an investment in ourselves and it makes us better people. When we get home, home is still the same, but we have changed and that changes everything. So when I come home, I know I'm not the same. You know, it can be very superficial, it can be very profound, but I know that wherever I've just been, and I always choose my destinations carefully, because I'm aware that you only have so many opportunities in your life. You know, whether you are a travel writer as I, or you have a conventional, you know, nine to five, or Monday to Friday, or even if you're freelance or if you're retired, you know, we all have lives, and you can't just get on a plane for six years at a time and circumnavigate the globe and see it all and do it. No, you have limited means and you have limited time. It's usually money and time that dictate or regulate where you travel and how long you stay once you're there and how you experience it once you're there. So I always travel my destiny, I always choose my destinations very discernedly because they're meant to be very special, life-altering experiences. It doesn't have to be on a grand scale, and it doesn't have to be crazy expensive or you know extravagant. It just needs to be someplace I've always wanted to experience and see. And it can be, you know, in our backyard. It can be domestic travel, or it can be, you know, remote so that the air long haul flight alone is 18 hours to get you there. So you know it's not close. But um, so when I do come back, and I try to live it to the max, I try to be very aware and in the present, and I try to always realize every moment and every person I meet and every dish that I experience and every vignette that I see and every walk we take is going to be something that will come back with me. So it all comes back with me. I think every place we've been to becomes a little bit a part of you. So when I come back, I'm always happy to come home because I will have just experienced something remarkable. And when I'm home, it's when I just stay, when I, when I um, gird, uh, what's the expression? When I um, just think and contemplate and relive it and re-experience it in a way and um, understand better and appreciate better. You know, you've created then at that point the perspective and the distance. And so I'm quite happy to come home. I, you know, I love my bed, my pillow. Usually my <laughs> husband is there waiting for me. So it's a plus. Um, but even when we're returning home together, we return home together happy. Because if you don't enjoy home, then I don't think you enjoy leaving it um, as much um, when you go to some place that's meant to be short-lived and special and some kind of experience outside of your same old, same old. So that when you return home, I love New York City. I'm lucky to have chosen a city that I think is one of the best cities anywhere on the globe. I traveled around a lot. I settled <laughs> temporarily in a lot of places. And then I settled in New York quite by accident. And that was um, about 30 years ago. So um, it's home to me. And is it, you know, does it have its warts and problems and crime rates and homeless and subway problems? You know, is it dirty? Is it congested? Are there garbage trucks at four o'clock in the morning, it's all that, but it's so much more and it's home and I love it. So I do go home happily and willingly.
with so much that I'm bringing with a full heart because wherever I'm coming home from, it's usually pretty special. Mm. You're welcome. Yes? What places are left that you haven't traveled to that you really want to? Oh, I, there are so many places I haven't visited because um, you know there are people out there who are of the seen there, done that, seen that, done that, whatever, been there, done that, uh, kind of approach to travel, you know, like uh, this, I met this young, um, super handsome, Argentine, 20 something <laughs> polo player. And I thought this guy has got it all going on because he looked like a Ralph Lauren ad. And he was from a very, very comfortable Argentinian family outside of Buenos Aires where they have the, pam the pampas and the gauchos and the polo farms and he was from this very privileged environment and family with the estancia that was like 500,000 million acres you know that whole thing and I was having a conversation with him and I had just just uh, published the book and his mother said you know Eduardo this young woman she did a book called and he said oh really he said a thousand and um he's and I said yeah I said a lot of it at that point <laughs> You know, was on my my um, bucket list, and he said, "Oh yes, I have a bucket list." And I said, um, "Oh no, no, no!" He said to me, "Oh, a thousand. He said, "I would have thought there would be, I don't know, three or four, and I was waiting for him to say thousand. And he felt that there were three or four things, places to see before you die. And this was his bucket list. I mean, he had the world at his, he had the possibilities and the opportunities at his fingertips. He could have said, you know, Papa, please send, send the plane. And, you know, take me and my 18 best friends to, you know, the Galapagos. And no, I think it was all about his horses and, you know, his gorgeous girlfriend. And he lived in a very small bubble. And that kind of amazed me to think that um, just because you have the means, it doesn't mean that you have the desire, or it doesn't mean you have the curiosity. And maybe he was curious about other things, but he wasn't curious about the world. So um, I think that you know, people who choose not to travel um, just will find reasons not to. But if you are interested and you do want to make it happen, then you will make it happen because there's um, always a way to make that happen. You know, whatever it is in life, I guess you make it happen. But I digress. And the places I haven't been to yet are many. I'm about 20% of the book I haven't yet been to. And I'm on the tippity top of my list. Uh, if anybody's going to New Zealand, I would like to come along. Or I'll wind up just going by myself because, but it's not uh, inexpensive and it's not close, um, and you need a chunk of time. And there's a North Island and a South Island, and each one's quite different from the other. And if you've watched the um, Tolkien series, the trilogy, and you see how just stunningly beautiful the countryside is. I it is. Yeah, is it wonderful? Mm -hmm. I don't want to know. No, I already know. And the wine I have been. Yeah, the incredible wine regions and whatnot. But okay. there's also a lot of um, Africa, Western Africa, that I haven't seen. I've been to Ghana and Mali, but Senegal and um, Nigeria and all, you know, Chad and um, Tom, uh, Togo and Benin and all these crazy countries. I mean, American tourism just doesn't really go there. And all of the Pacific Islands, the South Pacific Islands, I mean, are they heaven or what? Um, James Michener stuck his toe in the pool when he visited. Uh, French Polynesia in that area and said they are heaven on earth. So I'd like to check that out. Yes? Any place you wouldn't go? Um, Any place I wouldn't go? Um, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I went to Iran um, and we crossed over into Iraq for a few hours and then scurried back. Um, but even going to Iran, I got a lot of what? Um, because you would think reading the headlines and listening to the news that we're unwelcomed and that it's quite dangerous. And we're unwelcomed by the government, but the other 99% of the people are possibly some of the nicest, warmest, most intelligent, cultured, polylingual, traveled, welcoming, hospitable, I mean, I could go on. We were 
stunned. And that's what you want from travel. You want to be surprised because if you're not going to be surprised, if you've got it all figured out and you've done your homework, then you know you just stay at home because why spend all of that effort and money to go? But um, so there are a lot of destinations where we're encouraged to think that we shouldn't go. We probably can't find many people who have been there, um, but they haven't been there just for reasons that are you know known to them and not to you. So. I would, you know, if there's any place that interests you and you're thinking, oh, I'm not hearing much about Senegal, um, I would encourage you to go anyway and then come back and let me know how it is. One last question. Yes? Um, about Airbnbs. Do you embrace it? Do you find it? Do you want to experience in culture? Because I have, but um, hotels. Or... Yeah, so the Airbnb, um, there are, so first of all, <coughs> I've never used Airbnb. Um, I know, hard to believe, but I love hotels. I love the little inns that are family run, that are third generation, with dad behind the front desk and over making the beds. And, and you know, I've been in the family with six rooms with a big five star deluxe. Oh my God, pinch me. Am I really staying in a Maharaja palace in Rajasthan? And then everything in between. Um, so I just love the whole idea of hotels, and I collect hotels, and if I can't afford to go to these crazy, expensive, over-the-top, like Irish Castle hotels, then I go to the whiskey bar, and I hang out and have a drink and pretend that I'm staying for the week. Um, so so um, I've been hearing all of the horror stories about Airbnbs, and as is true with everything, you always hear the negative stuff. But they're pretty crazy, and I don't know if it's true that they make you do, you know, mow the lawn and do your own laundry before you leave and take out the trash. I don't know. Um, but my niece is a big fan, and she's been to about 20 of them around the world, and she keeps telling me I'm insane because I'm missing out on the Airbnb experience. So it's wonderful that it exists and that it's so easy and that you can rent pretty remarkable homes and not just a room with a, a host, but your own apartment, your own home with a swimming pool and a golf course, or your, you know, like everything is available and pretty much everywhere in the world. So I really encourage you to do it. Um, and usually they were such a such a bargain, but they seem to have increased in, in prices so that they're no longer the giveaways. But you have um, the, the opportunity to really feel like you have your own digs in Paris and you're living the life of the locals. So how cool is that? Yeah. Um, any questions? Or I'll just stop talking. Nadia's patrolling the grounds. Um, <laughs> but um, one last thing I wanted to say. We were talking about how I think 100 days from today, I may be off, so don't do the math. What do you think is happening 100 days from today? Christmas. So is this the best gift for those in your life who either travel a lot or you would like to see you travel a lot? Um, but I, is it possible that it's 100 days from today? Yeah. <laughs> well, we're close, right? We're 90 something. Yeah, but anyway, thank you very, very much for coming. I will sign books. I'm happy to answer any other questions you have if you want to just come up to the table. And thank you for coming, really. Thanks a lot. Thank you.